a very brief uh, introduction, uh, not very long at all. Uh, I'm going to run through uh, Michael's uh, biography, so you all know where he comes from and all that. He comes from California, and that's where he also did his uh, architecture education at the California Polytechnic University. That was he finished in 1997, and he worked in the 60s. to talk into the microphone for the recording, although I think there's enough reverberation in this room for you to hear me without it. 
so look, first I want to I want to thank um, Philip and Johan and Sylvia and Daniel for hosting me. It's been a wonderful couple of days. I've been really intrigued with everything I've seen here, and I'm happy to be here um, in Frankfurt. I also want to thank the students that I saw their work this morning. I thought it was a really interesting conversation, and it's great to hear you present your work and argue it and put it forward in the amount of clarity that you had. And for those of you who I didn't talk to, if I understand everything correctly, there's some kind of party going on tonight. And uh, feel free to come up and talk to me at the party. If I also understand things correctly, there's going to be tequila at the party. And since I'm the representative Los Angelino, uh, I might be the bartender. So putting me to work on, on this trip. So today I'm going to talk about two years, last two years. And I'm going to talk about it in three ways. Uh, what I've been thinking about, what I've been teaching, and what my practice, Young and Ayata, has been up to. So Young and Ayata with Kutan Ayata started 10 years ago. I'm not going to talk about the first eight years. I've been teaching for about 12 years. I'm not going to talk about for the, the first 10. And I've been thinking about things for about 44 years. I'm not going to talk about the first 42. Uh, <laughs> substantial amounts of those were not that interesting to talk about anyway. So we'll stick to these last last two years. All right. So I want to start with a statement. It's a statement that's a little problematic and uh, intentionally provocative. One of the things that the discipline of architecture is responsible for are the aesthetics of the background of reality. Now that's kind of a bold and uh, possibly problematic thing to say, so I want to break it up a little bit. So when I say background, what I'm intending is something very similar to Walter Benjamin's uh, claim in the work of art in the age of its mechanical reproduction, that architecture is the art form that is consumed habitually in a state of distraction. Now, the first time I heard that, it kind of pissed me off. I remember reading it as an undergraduate, and I thought, man, I don't want to be responsible for things that are consumed habitually in a state of distraction. I want to go to the foreground. I want to do the thing that people pay attention to. I want to know about that. I don't want to be in the background. But as I've paid more attention to this, and as I've kind of uh, maybe growing older, not wiser, but a little bit more experienced, I've begun to realize that this background is incredibly powerful. And it's very true. You walk around your cities, we walk around our environments, most of it we do not notice. Most of it is habitually there. It's a state of distraction, and it is a world that is behind us. It's what establishes the things that we assume to be the way the world looks. It is that background of reality. Now, reality is an even more problematic word, because I don't pretend for a second to know what reality actually is. I don't uh, think for a second that we have access to the entirety of reality. Reality is not only the things that are built by cultural constructs in the way we understand mediation, especially now with our world of screens. Our reality is hyper-visualized through images. It's also the imagination that we bring to it. But it is also stuff that is out there, that withdraws from us, stuff that is beyond our access. And I use this word because it's important to um, distance the, what, what I'm thinking about, what I'm teaching, and what I'm trying to do with my own practice from uh, a kind of fantasy escape, from things that are either utopian or dystopian. I want to try to hold to some sense of the ways in which we deal with our world, however we begin to construct it. And from this, aesthetics becomes crucial. And it's the aesthetics of realism that I'm interested in. Realism is not a copy of reality, the way it looks, a naive assumption about the way things are. Realism, if we go back from uh, Gustave Courbet and Emile Zola all the way to today, realism is something that puts a tension between reality and its representation. It actually produces a problem. It forces you to think that maybe the ways in which I assume reality to look are different than I've assumed. So it is not something that sits easily and sits naturally and sits in a settled relationship to what we do. It actually produces aesthetic problems about the way reality looks like. And another important thing about aesthetics, I want to offer that aesthetics is a third and equal way of relating to the world, um, equal to ethics and epistemology. Not more important than ethics and epistemology. We need to be ethical. We need to know what we know. We need to understand the knowledge systems that we produce. But aesthetics is an equal way of engaging. Aesthetics, the ways in which the world becomes sensible to us, is something that is not 
about the production of knowledge, nor is it uh, held to the same kind of productions as an ethical stance. And I say this because ethics and in in epistemology are usually what we use to ground aesthetic decisions. And instead, I want to put them all on three equal footings as ways of engaging the world. And when one problematizes the aesthetics of the background of reality, estrangement would be a word I would use, defamiliarization would be another. What comes from that is actually the possibility of a political position. If you can show the world to look other, to be other than what we assume it to be, you're opening a space, you're opening a place for new constituencies to form. You're opening up a new way for people to understand their relationship to that world and to each other. And in many ways, what else can that be but uh, beginning to define and beginning to provoke a political response? Okay. So, three words, I've already touched on two of them, uh, but this is how I'm going to start this conversation. Because abstraction, realism, and estrangement. Abstraction and realism being two of the words we've used throughout the 20th century to define modern art and modern aesthetics. And I just want to take a minute to think about what those really may be. So, two images here, and I put these up for a specific reason, because they are a kind of major touchstone when one thinks about what is abstraction and what is realism. And the reason these two are up there is in reference to the 1939 article that launches Clement Greenberg's career called Avant-Garde and Kitsch. And in that article, he's making a claim that the avant-garde art, uh, art of people like Picasso, the abstraction that it develops, is a progressive way forward, and the realism of something here, Soviet realism, is the kind of uh, straw man that he uses in his, in his argument, is a kind of retrograde or nostalgic form of art that holds one back and is used for things like propaganda and all other sorts of uh, problematics. We can talk later, if you want to, about Clement Greenberg's involvement with the propaganda of uh, abstract expressionism funded by the CIA. That's a whole other conversation. But uh, in this, abstraction leading to medium specificity, the painting becoming flat in its delimination of flatness. Uh, no longer is it representational to the way things look, but beginning to speak to the conditions of the medium of painting, whereas realism is still speaking in the conditions of sculpture and narrative and literature and other uh, art forms. And to be progressive, one must then ultimately become abstract. Now that's 1939. We can move 25 years earlier and find probably two more uh, iconic examples in the history of 20th century art for this question of realism and abstraction. So what could be more abstract than uh, Malevich's black square? This uh, rejection, the world as objectlessness, the desert of the senses, the rejection of the material conditions of the world for the spiritual uh, progression of the mind, the transcendence beyond, even the, to the point where in the 010 exhibition that this was shown at, the black square is put in the location of the Russian icon. Uh, displayed in the corner of the building, not on the flat of the wall. And then in realism, the unassisted ready-made, the bottle rack selected, uh, put into a gallery, signed by Duchamp, um, yet not altered at all. Something from the everyday, a thing of the everyday world revalorized by the institution and the artist to become a work of art. Now I say this because they're paradigmatic examples, but there's some other things we can think about if we pay a little bit of closer attention to them. And we try not to extend them beyond them as objects themselves, but think about other things that these works provoke. So in one very um, direct condition, something like the Black Square by Malevich is one of the first examples of an artwork that one looks at instead of looks through. Now it's pretty frickin' weird, because painting, since we know it from Alberti in the Renaissance, is this window or this veil out to the world beyond that one pro projects a narrative, a historia, through. And to have a painting that one looks at instead of through means that the painting becomes more like the objects of the world. It becomes more like the objects of everyday life. It becomes something where all of a sudden the cracks in the materiality of the paint really matter. You can look at a painting from the Renaissance and see the cracks, but you look through the cracks. They don't matter. What matters is what Piero has put there on the wood panel. But in Malevich's Black Square, it becomes an object in the material flow of reality. And in a way, that's a kind of realism. And for Duchamp, 
What's more radically abstract than the decontextualization of something killing its use function and putting it into a place where you no longer are able to see it as an object of use, but you begin to consider it as uh, an abstract formal construction? Now, if that's the case, then we have to actually reverse our words. And all of a sudden, the thing we thought was abstraction is realism. The thing we thought was realism is abstraction. And this becomes confusing. And I don't do this to confuse you. I do this to basically bring up the point that abstraction and realism are not uh, contradictory things. In fact, one of the ways one estranges reality is through abstraction. So abstraction can actually be a technique that we use as artists and architects to put a tension between reality and its representation. And it's also good to note that there are uh, seven official bottle racks uh, made between 1921 and 1964. And by made, I mean two of them actually were made. So uh, five of them were selected at random. Two of them were made by Duchamp uh, or instructed by Duchamp to be made after a photograph by Man Ray. So so all of a sudden we have other things here we have to talk about, uh, issues of seriality, reproduction, the role of the author, and all of those questions, which again become crucial for where is the agency, where is the aesthetic intent, who is it that is making the choices, and what are the effects that they have. All seven of those bottle racks, by the way, are all different. And if you look at them long enough, some of them begin to become kind of cute, and some begin to become kind of elegant, and some begin to become super creepy. And all of those aesthetic effects are somehow outside of usually the ways in which we talk about this as uh, it doesn't matter, choose a bottle rack, put it in, we're on our way. Now, I'd, I would suggest that this sort of tension or friction between abstraction and realism has been um, one of the major things that contemporary art has been dealing with. So I'll use uh, Taba Auerbach, a New York-based artist, as an explanation for this. So this is a series of paintings called Folds. And one of the interesting things that is produced by this work is that the first time you see them, it's like Trumpleo. It's like seeing uh, a fake version of reality, only it is not done through the expertise of technique, painting something like a still life. It is done by actually painting the canvas. And the other thing that you get from these is they look like three-dimensional sculptures. So are we looking at sculptures? Are we looking at trompe And yet they're flat, flat, flat as flat can be, which makes them all of a sudden appear as photographs. But they're not photographs. They're literally the canvas folded up, spray painted with diachronic uh, paint, and then pressed back flat to become the picture plane. So you are actually looking at a version of realism, real canvas folded, but you're also looking at a high level of abstraction. You could make comments here that relate to things like Frank Stella's uh, banded paintings and relationships between the, the frame and the content of the frame. And all of those things are playing together with each other, and the inference is that we're also talking about photography. So no longer is this any uh, argument about medium specificity. It's much closer to medium promiscuity, uh, post-medium condition where things are run up against each other and put in friction with each other and used to create a kind of estranged realism. Which brings me to photography. I think that all the media arts that extend from photography, and by this I mean cinema, animation, and everything that we do with a computer, uh, no, cannot be f uh, classified within the same kind of lineage of medium specificity either. Because photography always has this tension between are we looking at an objective trace of reality, or are we looking at a highly manipulated uh, false version of that reel. And this goes all the way back to the invention of photography. We'll talk about it in digital photography in a minute. But all the way back to the 19th century, imagine what it was like to see the photograph of that inch mite and think, oh my god, that's the thing that's been biting me in my bed? I mean, that's, that's going to make you think a little bit differently about going to sleep at night. It could probably creeped everybody out. It's still creeping me out. Um, and as simultaneously at the same time, as photography is giving the, the structure for mechanical objectivity in the sciences, an image made automatically, mechanically, not touched by human hands, just the index of light passing through a lens being caught in the emulsion of the chemical reaction of the film. It's producing things like spirit photography, which if photography is objective, then we just saw our first ghost. There it is. We got proof of ghosts. So we already have problems of what is true, what is real, what is abstract, what is manipulated. And of course, all that is is a long exposure. Um, so it is nothing other other than the trace of light through the picture. 
Now this issue of photography, um, I think is one of the most important for us to engage as architects today. These are uh, flowers. There are flowers made by Heidi Hatchery, uh, a New York-based artist as well, and she makes these flowers, but the reason they're here within photography is she also studies the genre of flower photography very closely. So composition, depth of field, softness of focus, where things sit within that field, um, it's all to the T within the genre of uh, flower photography. Only her flowers are not the normal flowers. And you see them and you know there's something a little bit off. Uh, now she makes her flowers out of animal offal. So all the parts of animals that we usually don't eat. Flowers are the aesthetic beauty of nature in our cultural consideration. We give them to our grandparents and to our loved ones, our boyfriends, our girlfriends, our lovers. Flowers are this kind of beautiful moment within nature. But flowers are also sex organs, and so all Heidi Hatchery is actually doing is making flowers out of animal sex organs instead of plant sex organs. And what this puts pressure on, and what I find kind of fascinating about this project, is you look at these, and you probably get a little disgusted at first, or you probably get a little freaked out or a little grossed out, but guess what? You have to make a decision now. You have to decide for yourself whether or not you're gonna let that into the category of beautiful. Because if you do, you've just shifted and stretched your relationship to it. If you don't, if it's out, you've defined a border for yourself. This is politics coming from aesthetics. Heidi Hatchery is a, is a feminist vegetarian. There's an amazing film of her making these flowers, which is just intense, because she's basically becoming a butcher in order to uh, create these flower, look, uh, flower constructions. And all of it slips through our first look, because we accept them, due to the realism of the photographs and due to the genre she's playing with, to be flowers. In fact, the first time I saw these, I walked through the gallery and said, huh, flower photography, that's some, uh, and then you see, you know, this one on uh, your right, and you think, oh man, there's something else going on here, and that's when you begin to engage it longer, more intensely. And then there's digital photography, and this is Philippe Dujardin, many of the architects probably know him, a contemporary Dutch photographer, uh, also an architectural photographer, which is interesting in his background. Now you look at this for a little while, and again, it looks like a photograph of a real town. Everything is there presented in its kind of direct photorealism, but quickly, or maybe not so quick, problems begin to arise. And you can probably already start to peek, uh, figure some of them out. I mean, there are things that are there, obviously some shifts into the roofs, some cuts and uh, uh, incisions into those kinds of roof structures, but then you begin to notice other things, like there are no windows. So a world without windows is not a world of inhabitation. The roofs and the buildings are too close together. That's a town without streets. So a town without streets and a world without windows, yet that's not the first thing you see. That's the second thing you see. So there's a critical statement here, but that critical statement is not put up front. It's put later, it's delayed. And the, photo the photograph instead is manipulated to begin to make you doubt, but not doubt initially, doubt secondly. I think this is one of the interesting things about many contemporary photo photography, is the manipulations that bring in a level of doubt after the reality has been accepted. And it's that that kind of structures uh, an extension, which is the, the work that Carrie Lambert Betty calls parafictional. There's many artists we can bring into this, uh, Walid Rod and the Atlas Group, the Yes Men, who have been jacking scenarios into the reality of the world to begin to provoke political statements. I'm gonna use two examples in this case. The first comes from the Spanish photographer, uh, Jean Van Cuberta. And so this is a project that he did in the 90s called the Odyssey of the Soyuz II. So, the records of the Russian cosmonaut program were uh, opened up after the, the kind of fall of the Soviet Union, and one of the things von Kuberta started researching was why between 1967 and 1940, there's 40, or 1981, there's 40 Soyuz missions, and yet we know nothing about Soyuz 2. What happened to Soyuz 2? 
So we started finding out that there was a Soyuz 2, and it was a manned mission, and there was this uh, cosmonaut, Ivan Isnochinikov, and he finds all the photographs of him speaking to the children and, and uh, at the launch site, uh, and he finds you know interesting things like the, the doctored photographs. So here's the officially released one, but he finds the original one where Ivan here is erased from history and uh, produces this entire exhibition based on exposing this cover-up of uh, a manned space mission that had went horribly wrong and thus the Russian space program covered it. Now what you don't realize at first but is given to you little by little through the exhibition is that every single picture is of Jean van Kuberta. So it's only pictures of him he is Ivan uh, Chernikov. That's just a loose translation of Jean van Kuberta into Russian. Um, so the entire thing is fake. The entire thing is constructed, which makes you look at this one again, because it means that this is the fake photograph, and this is the real photograph. But I'm looking at that real photograph right now, and guess what? I think somebody's missing. I think there was somebody here. I think somebody had some real issues with uh, the Soviet government and got removed from history. Sure, it wasn't Jean Falcuberta, but all of a sudden the project puts pressure on how we understand the multiple mediations. And as architects, always produces multiple mediations. Drawings, images, texts, models, scripts. We only work through multiple mediations. One of them is not building. They're all the things that lead to building. And it's good to see how these things play together to begin to produce a reality. Okay, so I'm gonna show a short film. It's about five minutes. Well, the Centrifuge Brain Project started in the 70s. Dr. Brenswick at the University of the State of New York was involved in a research on the effects of kindergarten rides on the learning curve of four-year-old children. We developed the idea of building a larger, stronger device to examine the effects also on adults. The first tests were a disaster. Um, it reached six Gs and it broke apart. We lost our academic standing. And then we had an idea. Matt's brother-in-law was on the board of a company that designed and manufactured amusement park rides. They had all the resources for us to continue our experiments. We designed our first real prototype, which was the Spherathon. When the rotation starts, the seats are lifted slowly by the centrifugal force, uh, causing the people to float upside down. The difficulty was stopping the rotation without people coming, crashing down in the upper levels. We established an independent company funded by amusement park visitors. Well, the more people that came around to the amusement park, you know, the more funding we had. The second machine was named the wedding cake because of the four platforms set on top of each other. These machines provide total freedom, cutting all connection from the world you live in, communication, responsibility, weight. Everything is on hold while you're being centrifuge. Some of the test results that year were a little too extreme to be published, so for the next phase we shifted our attention to height instead of acceleration. Well, actually the first day wasn't really planned out very well. Everybody wanted to get on and not realizing that it was a 14 hour ride, some people fell asleep missed their stops and had another 14 hours, you know, which, and you could imagine, you know, the problems that entailed.
Well, after the experience of the high altitude conveyance, we found that people needed something to do in there. And we introduced an interactive option. Each cabin was equipped with a button. This way they felt they had a little bit of control over the ride itself. Except for one incident where the expander was placed a little bit too close to the building, there were no real problems with it and there was a level of undefined brain activity around 30% higher than the kids who stayed on the ground. is the dandelion. It was designed to simulate the prenatal experience. For example, when a mother is walking, the baby would kind of move around. So we tried to compensate for the, the weight and size differential between an adult and a baby. behind this one was that the subject had no idea which track he was going to take. Unpredictability was an important aspect of our work. Which in many people resulted in readjustments of key goals and life aspirations. Using only 10,000 horsepower now, but I'm convinced once we reach 20,000, we're going to be free of all boundaries permanently, and it will be very stable. I mean, we had setbacks, but I wouldn't say that it was a mistake. It was not a mistake, if anything. The mistake is in nature. Gravity is a mistake. We fight the forces that hold us down, and whole life is an effort to escape from reality. That was a short film produced by Till Nowak. He's done some, some really kind of amazing things. Uh, now I show that, I, I look, I think it's, first of all, there is a, a kind of level of entertainment in it, but also I, I appreciate the kind of level of absurdity and humor and the importance of actually within the projects that we're attempting to do that uh, push forward into a kind of parafictional or an estranged reel. Uh, absurdity and humor is a thing that's not used uh, enough. And I think this one has a great touch of that to it. I also want to point out all the kind of crazy things that are in there, if, if you missed them, like the old computers with the bad graphics that are showing the things in blueprints, and he's looking at note cards and has graphs. All of this, this is, this is what we do by the way, architects, right? We produce things to try to convince people to spend sums of money to build our fantasies for the near future. We don't deal with now. Everything we do is near future. A building is going to be built one year, two years, five years from now. It's going to be inhabited 10 years, 20, 50 years from now. We are science fiction, parafictional artists. And we produce mediations to try to convince the world that the world can be other than they think it can be. This can be as simple as, hey, your kitchen can be better, you can throw better parties, or your city can be other. People can relate to each other in a different public sphere. Or, I can go on and on, you know what I mean. And uh, it's that kind of setup that I've been using in the last year and a half to run a series of workshops and studios. All of these are working with the kind of idea of a future interior. And so they're all workshops which project into, workshops and studios that project into a future reality. Um, so the first one I'm going to show is from a, a one-week workshop at the University 
of Minnesota and Minneapolis, uh, done in 2016. And this was about Minneapolis 2036. And so what I had all the students do is initially produce a fake newspaper. Now I just said that, those three words together, fake news and paper. Um, and I want to be clear about this uh, because I am in no way, shape, or form a supporter of the, the, the scary buffoon who is leading my country, and I want to make sure that you understand that. Uh, but there is something important about what's going on within this kind of political climate and the ways in which things are being mediated and projected to us as what is real and what is not real, that we cannot run away from. And just a few things to point out. Uh, first of all, uh, this is 2036, so yeah, of course it's going to be fake news. We're, we're making it up as we go along. Um, but when and where was this Garden of Eden of truth that we are now missing? As far as I look back, we've been dealing with similar problems. They may have accelerated and they have may have been now situated into an institution with a larger voice, but is that not also um, part of the tactics that we've been using within avant-garde art throughout the entire 20th century? Was not all of these artists in a way putting forward a kind of parafictional realism about the way in which the world operates? So the difference is to not hide, to not think that we can move back to a nostalgic moment where everything truly was true and really was real, but to see what ways we as architects can engage some of these tactics to produce that doubt, to produce that criticality, to maybe put it into a moment where we don't assume all of the images we see are what they are, but we begin to judge and look at them more intensely with greater effort and with a different kind of mind. So each of the students, so the students made a big newspaper where they took different problems that were going on within 2016 in the Midwest region of Minneapolis and projected them into the future. So here's, uh, actually there are wild turkey attacks going on in Minneapolis right now. The wild turkeys are only attacking toddlers, and they're only attacking toddlers because babies are not threatening to wild turkeys, and, and adults are, are like, I'm not going to mess with that thing. I don't know what it is. But a toddler and a wild turkey, you know, the turkey's sizing it up and saying, yeah, all right, I think I can take this toddler. Um, so what happens if we push that in the, into the future and more and more turkeys start attacking people? And so this student came up with the Home Depot nine-foot turkey-proof attack uh, vinyl wall fence. And also the uh, Nike turkey kicker and the, the North Face uh, turkey bite-proof full body suit. So what this is an example of is just to make us think about all the different ways in which mediums and media begin to establish the way we accept reality to be. Uh, another person was looking at um, a preservation of the pastoral wilderness of the Midwest. Uh, there's something very interesting about the questions of wilderness and wasteland. Wilderness and wasteland are the two places we can't build architecture. One is because we draw a line around a protected zone and say, in that zone shall be nature, shall be wilderness, and we shall not build. And think about how weird it is to draw a line and say, we're going to control the wild. Out here is, everything's fine, in there is the wild. Let's keep it in there. Uh, it's a cultural construct. And then the wasteland are the places which we have damaged through toxicity, nuclear waste, uh, trash, uh, overflows of industrial pollution. We can't build there either. So the two places we can't build, the wilderness and the wasteland. And what this project was documenting was that the prairie became a wilderness land of nostalgic ideas of what the pastoral American American landscape looked like, and one of the things that was important for the pastoral American landscape was the infrastructure of the highway system that was no longer being used since we now all had driverless cars that moved on uh, tram lines that took us into the cities. So each of these are, he was under the guise, the genre of fine art photographer, and doing these really kind of amazing photo collages, which have a great deal of strange subtlety to them, of people who decided to roll their suburban house out onto the infrastructure so that they would have views of this pastoral landscape of highways and prairies. This is another studio done this past year in, um, at the Cooper Union. 
So what these studios started to do was to go 40 years into the future, 20 years into the past. So the students were asked to not design anything, only to do archival research 20 years in the past of 40 years in the future. So you go to 2056, we're all in 2056, and you're only looking back to 2036 to 2046, and just documenting stuff that already happened. Don't design anything, you're not designing anything. Just document 20 years that happens 40 years from now. Um, so th this group of students was documenting the change to the Manhattan infrastructure of delivery, which was now done all by drones. And so the 13th floor of Manhattan was removed. 13th floors, by the way, are usually bad news through superstition, so they, no one really complained about it being uh, chucked out and this became a drone zone. So the entirety of Manhattan had a slice through it where drones would be able to move and deliver goods and services ignorant of the grid below. Uh, they did a whole series of uh, construction documents. Amazon was, of course, the funder for Amazonia, this new drone uh, habitat. You know, there's places like a drone nest for them to power up. It's all tied to then data servers that are occupying these zones above. Um, but of course, the Historic Preservation Board was pissed off because Central Park now got a, a flat top. And so Amazonia had to also historically preserve the iconic skyline of Central Park. And this was done through a series of steel structures that supported only the facade, and it also in impacted greatly real estate values because you now had top apartments with direct skylights and drone delivery wells to drop things down through the apartments, so everybody had now the ability to have interior rooms, so uh, an apartment building that had four apartments now had 12, and this drove up uh, rents and landlords increased their uh, profits greatly. This is a team that was looking at uh, accelerating Times Square. And I didn't quite like this one, so I'll, I'll just tell you that already. But what I liked in their argument was that Times Square, in the production of an ever more intensified image culture of electronics and uh, electromagnetic energy, was actually uh, producing buildings that were uninhabitable so that the buildings would become gigantic machines, gigantic server farms and uh, ventilation booths and uh, uh, other kinds of mechanical devices that were there purely to fund and to put together and to power this massive public space of image. These are the projects, or two of the projects, that are now on display in Athens. This was a studio done at Yale, uh, looking at Iceland. Again, a very similar present, uh, a very similar idea, moving 40 years into the future, looking 20 years into the past. And so Matthew was looking at geothermal technology in Iceland. Iceland is a very strange condition to look at because it's producing 99% of its energy through geothermal and hydroelectric, making it the greenest and cheapest place to produce energy on the planet, which means that if you, if you um, mine raw aluminum ore, or I should say aluminum ore, in Australia, you then ship that aluminum ore to Iceland to smelt it into aluminum to then ship back to Australia because it's cheaper to do that. So the greenest energy on the planet is producing a massive carbon footprint of waste as you ship material halfway across the globe to then be smelted in Iceland. So uh, Iceland's sitting atop the rift of this two tectonic plates between North America and Eurasia produces this incredibly strange landscape. What Matthew here was looking at was uh, this geothermal off-gassing that uh, could then be harvested to produce a new mineral. So these were a kind of dirigible that was moving around these little nozzles or nipples on the Icelandic geothermal plants and uh, extracting the waste to produce a new material of which then produced new landscapes of uh, uh, toxicity that as they stained the landscape um, became a kind of attraction for flyover aerial photography. I'm sure some of you have seen this before. Some of the most beautiful aerial photography done right now in the world is of the most toxically horrible sites on the planet. This is a, this is a really interesting contradiction, and think about it. Uh, the, the photographers that are, are using this are raising awareness through aesthetics of the ways in which we are damaging the planet through a combination of artificiality and natural processes. This is model. 
one more project from that studio. This is Heather's project where, uh, for one reason or another, a, a number of semi-vernacular semi structures started popping up in the hinterland of Iceland, and no one knew what they were doing or, or what was going on there. So Heather, you know, if this is 2056, uh, no one's an architecture student anymore. They're all taking on different roles. So she's an investigative scientist that uses um, electrode tomography to scan buildings, usually scanning for uh, cargo ships to see what's being smuggled in. And what she found inside of these supposedly vernacular structures was this whole world of technology and that these were hidden hacker data farms that were uh, illegally tapping the energy of Iceland to then produce uh, a series of nefarious potentially or um, successful, potentially, spots of hacking. So hackers would go live in these sheds, and they had the machinery, the technology, and the energy to begin disturbing the world's data systems. Okay. So now I'm going to go through a few projects that Young Nayata has done over the last two years to try to say a little bit about how this has played out in our own work. So the first is an exhibition called Base Flowers that was happening during the Chicago Architecture Biennale in December 2015. Get some water. And what we did was a series of flower vases. So flower vases, a good flower vase does three things. One, it has water, so it can suspend the assassination of the plant that you've put into it and let it be uh, alive for a little bit longer for you to enjoy its death. So it has to do that. Two, it has to pose that flower or groups of flowers into a pleasing uh, arrangement or composition. So it has to present character. And three, it has to disappear. You don't see it. You're supposed to see the flowers. You're not supposed to see the vase. So what we developed was a series of vases that was five vases all smuggled into one body that then as you tumbled it around would take on different characters and different postures. And some of them would be funny and some of them would be slouchy and some of them would be aroused and some of them would be lazy and some of them would be curious. Posture, character of the flower vase and made a series of little black ones, some that kind of aggregate and stack on top of each other that were 3D printed in uh, ceramic or coated with a, a kind of uh, rubber pumice. And then these larger ones, which were multi-material prints uh, embedded with a kind of uh, tattoo that moves along their surface. Now, all of this was a way of actually getting you to not look at what the real project was. So the real project was, we also made a whole bunch of fake flowers. And those flake flowers were jacked into these flower vases, and no one noticed them. This is that project of the estrangement of the background. Everybody's looking at the vases because they think that's what we've done. Of course, that is what we've done. But we've also made a whole bunch of flowers which are somewhere between the floral, the geological, the animal, and the digital. And these things are hidden in plain sight in each of the flower vases. And to me, the, su the success of the project was the moment in which somebody was walking by, looking at it, and then just had to touch it. And that's when I knew that that person was at that level of that threshold of attention, that they didn't trust what they were looking at anymore, and they had to touch it. Um, we also produced a series of electron microscope uh, zooms into the scales of each of these flowers and found out that there was a whole bunch of different kinds of problems, of textures, of viscosities, of uh, uh, roughness. Once you zoomed in at the microscopic, this was our investigation, a little bit of the problem of scale and digital technology, where everything is at a low resolution and really what makes a difference is zoom. Okay. Second project. This was for an exhibition at SciArc uh, 2016, a little bit over a year ago, where a group of 16 architects was asked to do the contemporary digital detail. So how did digital fabrication technologies adjust contemporary architectural details? So this is us here in the back. The front row is Neil Denari and Frank Gehry and Tom Main and Greg Lynn. Uh, we're the young kids. They put us in the back corner. I think they also put us in the back corner because we were doing something a little bit different. So so what we decided to do was look at the most common detail that architects use in every single contemporary construction, which is the fry reglet wall reveal. The detail you're not supposed to see. The thing that's there to turn the wall into an abstraction. That you no longer have to hide the baseboard. The baseboard can be flush and thus the wall just becomes a line of shadow and floats there. 
abstractly, not assembled, not touching that which is next to. Now these are kind of weird things just in and of themselves, this whole family of fry riglet wall reveals. Uh, so this is our family. Uh, a little bit closer to David Cronenberg's Dead Ringers instruments, but uh, our family of wall reveals nonetheless. And so we jack these into the most standard construction we could possibly do, a bunch of 2 by 10 Simpson joist hangers, uh, real gypsum board, and produced this series of these four internal corners that all had different characteristics we were trying to explore. So one tried to pull, this one tried to pull the corner infinitely back into space, which meant there could be no construction behind it. This one tried to flutter the corner to allow the uh, verticality to pass up into the ceiling cavity. This one tried to turn that corner into a point by putting pressure onto it, kind of bulging out and then pop the corner as an abstract little dot. And it was this one here though that we found to be the most successful. Because this just made everything look wrong. It made it look like the wall was just freaking out. And that was, was our favorite detail, that, that it actually sat now in the background. Um, I should say there's also something funny about this in terms of scale, because the whole thing is one to one. So it's a full scale construction. But when you look at it uh, from far away, it looks fine. When you stick your whole head into it, it looks fine. But at some scale in between there, you're not sure if you're looking at a model. That light bulb looks too big but it's just normal light bulb. And so somehow scale becomes defamiliarized from this as well. And then we started jacking these into the most banal interiors we could possibly find and sending them around to our friends to, to see if they could tell what we'd done. And, uh, you know, most people came back with, oh, uh, you put the Paul McCarthy sculpture in there. And I'm like, yeah, we did. We put the Paul McCarthy sculpture in there, uh, Snow White uh, with uh, um, Dopey's hat. Um, but we also started to disturb that background to see if there was something that could be done to create a different aesthetic relationship to banality if one started to expose the abstraction of what the wall is itself within modern construction. Okay. So this is a project that's under construction right now in Mexico City. So it's a developer project of nine apartment units, and we knew we could not uh, fight this developer on size of the unit. We knew we could not fight them on the construction system. We knew it was going to be concrete post and slab with concrete fair face walls. But we figured that we could do something with the windows. And so what we did is we rolled all the windows as ruled surfaces into the interior of the apartment, which allowed us to completely maximize the square footage for each apartment and as buildings get built up around it, every apartment will still have clear views, uh, not looking at their neighbors but looking obliquely. They created these uh, interior rooms which were kind of splitting your vision from one way to another. We didn't tell the, the client this but we, we equated them to Smithson's uh, inantomorphic chambers where as you approach your vision gets split and infinitely reproduced in the reflection of the mirrors. Um, so everything had to be in that window. It had to be in the defamiliarization of the aperture. So this is where all our effort went. Uh, now, fortunately for us, the project got put on hold because the client didn't pay off the right building official. And so the first experiments and mock-ups like this one were really not so good. So that delay let us do a whole series of other mock-ups. We went around looking at Candela churches, trying to understand how he did world surfaces and the ways he board formed them, and came back with another system, another way to build it. Now, the, the funny thing, too, is that we have to get the board forming into the concrete, even though the concrete's underneath the boards. So we built this as a, as a, a mold to make fiberglass molds to then put on top of the concrete to then uh, begin to inscribe the ways in which that ruled surface would move. And in these full-scale mock-ups, which we're much happier with now, uh, some very strange things begin to occur. And what we quite uh, love is the way in which this, the light kind of comes right around that corner and makes this incredibly heavy concrete wall appear like a knife edge. And it's in that that actually it's not the window that is weird. In this project, it's the floor slab. It's actually the floor slab that's being defamiliarized by doing what we're doing to the windows, which is a pretty huge change to that building, something that you don't notice at first, something that's sitting there in the background, but uh, actually is the result of this change to the aperture. 
Okay, how am I doing on time? I'm, I'm all right, I got just a few more. So this was a competition entry that we did for a contemporary art museum in Lima, Peru. Uh, also the, you know, Lima, Mali, the Museum of Art, Lima, we kept calling it Mali and then people kept thinking we're doing a project in Africa. We're not doing a project in Africa, but the contemporary art museum in Lima is called Mali, which is, which is already interesting in its own right. So the site for the project was right here next to an existing neo-colonial building. And one of the things with the brief was that you could not block the neo-colonial facade. You had a height limit of one meter. And I don't know about you, but most buildings that have a height limit of one meter are gonna be kind of problematic. Uh, so what they wanted was a building that was suppressed into this zone next to the project. And so what we came up with was this sort of landscape of uh, retaining walls that became a kind of sunken, almost ruin, sitting next to the building. That's the, the site plan of how it began to lay out. The site plan comes from an, a series of drawings we were doing simultaneously exploring completely disciplinary uh, argument about local symmetry and global symmetry. If you think about symmetry, and I'll just do this really short uh, spiel, all architecture uses symmetry in some manner. Um, if you have total global symmetry and total local symmetry, you have a grid. If you have uh, no local symmetry and no global symmetry, you have vomit or dust or something like that. Um, so usually architects do some combination of uh, global symmetry with local asymmetry. That's the dominant thing within modernism. Uh, what we were interested in was local symmetry with global asymmetry. Uh, and this is much closer to, instead of trying to do a balanced of expression, trying to do something more like flower arrangement. Flower arrangers are people who use local symmetries and global asymmetries. Uh, the same thing happens in dog piles and things like this, where you have a locally symmetrical object aggregating asymmetrically. And this also was a kind of exploration of the bas relief, of the low relief ruin. So these things would become these charred timber uh, retaining walls that over time would begin to become submerged by the grass that was built there. So that when it was fully grown, all that would be left are these kind of uh, Easter Island heads or former silos of nefarious activities underneath. And the neo-colonial facade and all of its sort of problematic relationships between the colonialization of uh, uh, Peru and its the respect of Lima for the architecture that happened at that time would be shifted so that it would look newer than our building. That was the hope, is that our building would be older than the old building and that that would displace the ways in which people assumed uh, progress happened or the fiction of contemporary art, the idea that you can have but the contemporary is a fiction. You can say we were contemporaries, but to say we are contemporaries is redundant. You're here and I'm here, of course we're contemporaries. Uh, so anyways, um, so the plan at uh, ground level, this is the stair you enter under. The first level beneath is all classrooms, all educational uh, in lecture halls. And then you come down through this door around, down another big staircase, and it's just a big open room. And a big open room that can be configured in any way it needs to be uh, very, very good with uh, curatorial flexibility. But really what this building was, was a big building that was hung, floated in a bathtub of infrastructure, hung on a series of Verendale trusses, so that as you went from above ground to below ground, this thing hanging as an object in space, to the moment you got underneath it entirely, and you saw what was the most insane mechanical duct layout that you'd ever experienced in your life. Which means that the building's upside down. All the foundations are above you and all the mechanical systems are below you and you just turn the entire thing upside down and float it so that when you're beneath the building you're actually above the building and when you're above the building you're actually beneath the building and that transference of going underground to produce a building that only had a one meter high height limit uh, was the f what was forced by their competition brief. Two systems interacting, a mechanical system, light system, and the foundation wall system to produce this kind of sandwiched world between. Okay. So 
Uh, in 2015, we had the honor of winning a first place prize in an open competition for the new museum for the Bauhaus in Dessau to celebrate their centennial. Uh, 871 entries that were then whittled down to 25 finalists that were then selected as two first place prizes. Now, I don't know about you, but most things don't have two first place winners. I've seen the Olympics. There's not two first place winners for those things. So one should already be suspicious. Um, all right, so when we entered this competition, we knew we didn't want to do this. Um, it's not because we don't like Gropius in, in the warehouse or the uh, workshop building at, at Dessau. It's an amazing building, an important piece of architecture. But we knew we did not want to do that. If the Bauhaus meant anything as an idea still within contemporary architectural culture, it would not be to celebrate its centennial by reproducing exactly the aesthetics of what it did 100 years ago. It had to be something other. Also importantly, this was not a museum for the architecture of the Bauhaus house, which is what we usually as architects know. This is a museum for the workshops of the Bauhaus, which involved all sorts of absurd, insane things, uh, from Schlimmer's uh, uh, theatrical productions to the textile glitching of modern manufacturing technology to the ways in which Marianne Brandt would make objects that were uh, working off of industrial manufacturing with, with, with different pure geometries and abstraction, and Maholi uh photograms exposing the possibilities of the, the, the developing technologies of, of photography. Also color, color was important for this as well. And then the last thing to say is that the museum is located here in a park in the center of Dessau, not over here. Here's the Gropius building. So its site was not next to the Bauhaus workshop building. It was in the center of the city in a park. And a park is a weird place to put a building. So what we did is we worked off a module. We worked off a module that was like a pavilion. And that pavilion would cluster together, aggregate together as a collection of individual individual objects, individual objects collected together, huddled together, and floating on this site. Now, we wanted this to do something um, along these lines of estrangement. So how could you produce a building which from the outside looked like a number of very distinct individual objects, but inside was organized in a completely different logical matrix manner? So the plan is circles and a grid. That's it. Only circles only grid. And I don't know about you, but that's about as dumb as you can get. If you want to do a plan, do only circles, do only grids, and that's the plan. And yet, when this thing comes together, uh, each of these modules, which are rotated from each other, and then they intersect, and uh, they get cut across a datum invert, and then float above the ground so you can walk underneath the building at any point in the park. Um, would never be read as a gridded building, would never be read as a matrix building, would never be read as a building of circles. Instead would be read as a huddled, clustered uh, series of objects. There was, a, there was a great deal, I don't know if anybody saw this, there was a great deal of hatred in the German press for us. Uh, they said it looked like garden gnomes, they said it looked like teeth, they said it looked like minions, they said it looked like all these different things, which for us, by the way, is fine, just as long as it didn't look like one thing. If it looks like 25 different things, cool, that's fine with us. Uh, but but it was definitely not, to them, Bauhausian, even though we viewed it as being an extension of those technologies, of those aesthetics, and of those experimentations. So the entire thing is clad in very small colored glass tiles. And we wanted the outside to read as if they were fired ceramic vases, vessels, and then we wanted the courtyard inside to read as glitched out textile patterns. So we took a number of the textile patterns from the Bauhaus and began to interrupt them. Interrupt them not only with the geometry of the curved surface, but also interrupt them with uh, the robotic manufacturing processes. This is from Arteic, a company out of Boston, where you, you produce an image, they discretize it into bits of tiles, and then the, the robot that comes in and go, grabs each color tile and puts it on, it becomes a panel, that panel goes out to the site, they fit together and produce the overall tiling effect. The plan itself has, floats above the ground where each of the legs touches down as a kind of different flower garden. You enter along this diagonal axis from the corner of the city and you come into this entry court. You pull up, there's a cafe in the middle, temporary gallery to the, to the right, and then this intestinal series of pockets of permanent gallery um, to your left. 
So here's the elevation, all of these things floating and huddled together above. You enter down the crotch. You move to the left, up a staircase. The staircase really pulls you into a, an entry which is above you as opposed to in front of you, the park coming through the, the ground condition. Ground condition, I always hate saying things like ground condition. It's not a ground condition, it's a ground. Just saying. Uh, you come up into the cafe. The cafe is the only place where the tile comes into the building. There's one column in the building that's not actually a column. That's the rainwater leader. It's the one place where we couldn't get rid of the rainwater and we had to put this through the building. Um, then the, the entire gallery is on one floor. It's on a, on a single level. And it's where all of these vessels join together at their most circular moment. And it's actually one concrete base. So that's one construction below, and then a series of hats. And each of the hats are made from a timber lattice that was insulated by packing it full of earth and hemp. So we were happy that this was a building that, that uh, if it went up in flames, you'd have a happier deso. And, but provided also a, an economical and very um, thermally stable environment for each of the, the projects, each of the, pro each of the each of the volumes. So when these things meet, they fuse. And then this was really kind of for us the key moment. Exterior, a, a number of like objects. Interior, a number of unpredictably fused spaces. So these things would combine in clusters of one, two, three, and four. And as they combine together, each time it would produce this sort of unpredictable fluting. So as you walked around a grid that was all a bunch of circles, each time you went through it, each time you saw each of those different spaces, interior-wise, would become a different kind of vertical space, a different spatial experience that was unpredictable and added a kind of uh, interest into the collectivity of moving through the building. All right, so here were the two first place winners. Um, you know, well, of course, right? You know, we've got 871 entries. Yes, yeah, obviously it should be those two. Uh, so I, look, I don't, I'm, I don't want to sound like a jerk, and I don't, I don't have sour grapes. It was really hard thing to lose. We had to go through a series of. Uh, uh, tertiary presentations where we hired um, cost consultants and contractors and, and local architects and um, expediters and code reviewers and a, a, a translator in German for every presentation, even though everybody that we were presenting to spoke English. But all of this was fine, but we did lose. Uh, and they're building the top one, which is by a team from Spain, uh, Gonzalez Heinz Zabla, and it's a fine building, and, and that's just the way it goes. But, uh, you know, there is a silver lining because it's really actually fairly expensive to do an all-glass building, and so they came back to us, and, and uh, in, in 2037, we had the possibility of converting <laughs> the Bauhaus into the Dessau Electromagnetic Remediation Center. <laughs> You know, unbeknownst to us, since the entire building was, was highly wired and uh, one of the first fully internet um, of things embedded buildings, it produced a huge electromagnetic field. And this started to produce uh, a strange social effect where people from all over the region were gathering to hang out in the park to get free energy and free Wi-Fi. And so this became a kind of encampment. And the city of Dessau became worried. There was an uh, increase in crime. Uh, and they needed to do something about it. But fortunately, there was a series of scientists that uh, in Macronesia invented a, a way in which to convert electromagnetic energy uh, down to solar radiation to um, produce oxygen out of uh, artificially constructed trees. And so these guys, they did this study and figured out that the, the park right outside of uh, the Dessau Bauhaus Museum was a perfect place to do it. The, the Bauhaus Foundation removed all the artwork that was on display and put it into a black box shed outside of Barcelona. And uh, the scientists came in and began to produce this system studying the electromagnetic forces, studying the ways in which they would chemically react with the tree cells. Uh, uh, and then a very strange problem occurred because the citizens of Dessau started getting sick. 
there was more oxygen. The CO2 levels were down, oxygen was up, that's good. But the electromagnetic magnetic radiation was beginning to affect the people in the neighborhood. And so somehow they wanted the oxygen, they wanted the energy, but they didn't want the electromagnetic uh, intensification. But since the Bauhaus Dessau Museum was made with hemp reinforcement insulation, the interior was an electromagnetic free zone. And so they hired us to go and retrofit it, to turn it into a kind of encampment of people who wanted a moment of electromagnetic silence. And it became so successful that they actually moved the building back to an exhibit, exhibition space and they brought the work back and it was all happy by the end of this. Um, so this is, a, this is an article that we wrote that just got published by MIT and it's already pissing so many people off uh, and already gathering uh, total frustration and, and confusion. But for us, Every project has an afterlife, and that afterlife is part of the future that we produce as architects. And so even if you lose a competition, you can piss people off in the future and uh, know that your architecture has other possibilities. So the thing I'm going to end with is the image that I showed first. So this is from an artist, Tavares Strachan, uh, a graduate of Yale not, not too long ago, the Yale MFA program. And what you're looking at are two pieces of ice. So what, what Tavares did is he went to the North Pole. And he went to the North Pole and cut a block of ice at the exact point of the North Pole. Which, by the way, think about what an abstraction the North Pole is. A line that moves as an axis through a sphere that touches that sphere surface at one point, cut a block of ice out. Now we know our planet wobbles, so it doesn't actually have a single North Pole. We also know magnetic north is somewhere else. But he did this. He cut out that um, block of pure North Pole ice, brought it to New Haven, and had the chemistry department clone it. So one of these is the real North Pole ice chunk, and one of them is a cloned North Pole ice chunk. And then he sculpted it as a good sculptor would, to look exactly like the original thing he cut out. So one of them was cut out raw and brought. The other one is sculpted to look like uh, the real North Pole ice. And there's all these kinds of strange things. So this is at the Venice Biennale where uh, Tavares was representing the Bahamas. Um, the strange things one thinks about is which one is real, which one is fake. If you went up to the North Pole right now and cut a piece of North Pole ice, it would not be the same chemical makeup as the one that Tavares cut because the North Pole ice shelf is always moving, always shifting. And so actually these two are more equivalent than the one that you would go get right now. So does it matter which one it is? Uh, the other thing to think about here is it is a uh, serious critique on climate change because in about 20 years you'll be able to drive, drive, paddle a canoe across this spot. You'll no longer have North Pole ice. The only place that will have North Pole ice is the Bahamas. And these will be the two pieces of which one is real and one is real real. And which one is more real and which one is less real is uh, uh, not the question that's being asked, but the question that it's provoking. And so from that, from realism, from abstraction, from simulation, and from the artificiality of maintaining a piece of nature within uh, an energetic construction, we're getting a comment, we're getting a critique, and we're getting uh, a thought about the planet in a different way. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you for paying attention. And